welcome to a very special and festive episode of Informed Investor brought to you by the National Stock Exchange. I'm Sumera Abdi and here is wishing all our viewers a very happy and prosperous new year and we hope that you had an absolutely fantastic Diwali. So the year gone by has seen its share of up and ups and downs and between Diwali to Diwali though, the Nifty has seen a rise of over 9%. So that's always a good sign and the star performer has been the traditional defensive space. So although stocks would have uh, you know, varying performances, the FMCG index itself has registered a growth of over 40% with the new bastion of media stocks seeing an upsurge of nearly 30%. So you wouldn't be too disappointed also had you invested in either the pharma or the banking space. Both spaces have recorded up moves of 20% apiece. It's a similar story for the auto index. However, those who put their money in IT might have had a bit of a tough year. But uh, not to mention metal and infra, both are spaces that didn't find favor with investors. But <laughs> that almost has taken my breath away. But let's make sense of what the year has and hasn't been and where to put your money in the coming year. With me today are two of our leading experts. We have with us Sharmila Joshi and Hemant Rustagi. Thanks so much for coming to our studios and a very, very happy new year to both of you. But, you know, before we get to our experts, I want to take into consideration also the year 2013, which was, uh, you know, not just about the headline indices, but it's also been about individual stories. And it's not just the equity markets, but across asset class, the focus has been on individual stories. So as far as equities though are concerned, in this year investors' uh, favorites, ITC and HDFC Bank, took full position. The other big private sector bank, ICICI Bank, also rewarded investors. Although long-time favorites, Reliance Industries and Infosys continued on a bit of a downward spiral. Sharmila, I want to come to you first that, you know, although this new, uh, new year so far has been a bit on a downward, uh, you know, a downbeat note, so to say, but like all things new, it holds out hope and promise for investors. So what are you advising your clients now? And uh, are they looking enthusiastic to you about, uh, you know, investing in the markets, about perhaps being long in this market? Uh, you know, I think that as you said, uh, the possibilities are very exciting uh, going ahead because I think that we are going to be stepping into a new phase uh, in the sense that uh, a lot will happen uh, next year. So I think from Diwali to Diwali, you are going to see a lot of changes uh, around you, not just I think uh, definitely on the domestic front because hopefully we will see interest rate cycles peak out. So we'll start seeing uh, maybe in January some interest rate cut come in. Uh, you'll have the last budget. Then you'll have, you know, you'll be uh, leading up to uh, the general elections. You'll have had state elections uh, in the interim. So a lot of things will change, whether it is politically, whether it is, uh, you know, the policy push. Uh, so things will become a lot less, uh, uh, you know, just now very unclear. So, you know, that uh, certainty will uh, come in. Also, I think on the international front, uh, you do have a new president now, uh, uh, re-elected <laughs> rather for uh, four more years. So he is going to give, uh, you know, his policies a push. Plus the Europe situation will uh, kind of sort itself out. So things are going to look very different and hopefully uh, for the better I would say uh, in the coming year and hopefully that should uh, mean good things for equities. I think the bad part is that we are not seeing that enthusiasm at least on the retail uh, uh, from the retail clients yet and uh, with reason because I think that even in uh, among the stocks that have done uh, sectors that have done well you would have to be you know invested in particular stocks right. for you to have really uh, made the money. So uh, let's see how that uh, pans out. Hopefully uh, the re retail will uh, get onto the bandwagon fast enough because I don't think that you can really call it a bull market unless there is you know, significant uh, uh, participation from uh, retail clients. So I think that is the missing bit and hopefully that will uh, uh, come into place in this coming year. We all live in hope and that's what we're here to do is to encourage retail participation because like we've been saying through the entire series that you know equities are not entirely evil but uh, it's not been a year just of equities. Other asset classes have also found favor although the returns haven't been you know much to investors satisfaction. Gold, uh, for instance, has behaved more like a bank FD, while those invested in silver wish they weren't. <laughs> and if there's one thing that, uh, you know, perhaps came up repeatedly through the year, it was the sordid saga of the rupee. That currency has uh, lost about 11% against its benchmark. Heyman, I want to ask you about this entire investment in other asset classes. You know, for instance, we've been talking about gold and silver. How does a person, you know, decide to diversify uh, his asset? Because if you just look at the past performance in the one year, it hasn't been fantastic. So what's a good strategy then, uh, you know, for people to decide 
decide how to invest in other asset classes and how much they should be allocating? Well, let me begin with uh, you know discussing how much role a past performance should play in the portfolio. Uh, you know, the key factor for investors to realize is that even when you're looking at a past performance, you should be looking at long term, maybe five year, ten year, especially if you're talking about an asset class like equity. Now, relying on short term performance can actually backfire, and the reason for that is because it neither indicates the true potential of an asset class, nor it basically tells you about the risks that are associated with an asset class. Now, what happens is when you rely on the short term performance of let's say six months or one year, you end up either having overexposure or underexposure. Right. Now, if you have overexposure to let's say an asset class like equity, the chances are it will take you beyond your risk taking capacity. And if you talk about underexposure to an asset class like equity, then you are actually risking your somewhere financial future. So, I think the key factor is to really go beyond that and which are the factors that one should look at is one clearly is one has to go by one's asset allocation and how do you decide asset allocation is look at your goals look at how much time you have to achieve each of these goals and also look at your own risk profile once you decide your asset allocation stick to it do not keep changing it every time when you see an asset class doing very well so for example if gold is doing very well now you gave example of gold uh, if you see last one year return uh, debt funds have done better than gold Right. And even some of the good quality equity funds have done better than gold. Now, if you look at year before that, obviously there was no comparison. The gold was like winner all the way. So I think it's, one has to go by one's own asset allocation and, like I said, stick to that. Don't keep changing it every time. Uh, and I think that is the key for an investor to really build this portfolio. Sure, and you know, we give a good bottle of wine time to mature. So let's also give, you know, be generous enough uh, when we decide on asset classes and give them also time to perform. But let's get in our first query. We have Nilesh who calls in from Mumbai and I believe he has a query on media stocks. Go ahead, Nilesh. Hi, I am Nilesh here. I've heard a lot of experts on your channel, namely Mr. Rakesh Junjunwala and Mr. Damani. Uh, recently, they have been very bullish on media stocks. So far, none of these companies have really performed well. What do you all think? Is it a good time to buy into the media sector as of now? All right, Nilesh. Uh, Sharmila, that's a query that's right up your alley. What do you say? See, I think, you know, it's interesting that uh, uh, what he's trying to say is that uh, uh, they've not made uh, money so far. So I think that's precisely the point, you know, when somebody like uh, Mr. Junjunwala or Mr. Damani picks a sector, they're trying to really uh, look into the future and see right. what could be the possibilities of uh, companies or sectors going ahead and what could find uh, a, a favor, uh, not just with, uh, uh, meaning in terms of uh, doing well themselves, but also a favor with uh, uh, investors and I think if you heard them the logic basically is that uh, uh, since now you have an economy that has expanded to an uh, you know X size and uh, people ha have met their basic needs then the fourth missing piece is always going to be entertainment right. and you know that's going to be uh, what people will spend their uh, money on and people do have that surplus money to spend so I think from that perspective uh, they, they look at a lot of these stocks and uh, then they look at where they are positioned and uh, they you know that's the bas basic basis of the recommendation. Even out of that space, I think if you see uh, the, you know, you'll have to divide it between, uh, you know, just not look at media, but, you know, who's into what, who, whether they're into broadcasting or whether they're into the right. movie business or whether, you know, they're cable players like in Hathaway or a Dish TV, which are benef uh, likely to benefit from the uh, digitization, which has just started, you know, one phase is over. Uh, second will come up uh, in March 31st. So, you know, you have to look at it uh, like that. And I think then within that you have to find your pick. So I agree. I think that there is a lot uh, of upside in, mo uh, you know, in, within each of those segments you would find uh, stocks which you can uh, stay invested in. So I think it's a great idea. You should definitely look at it. Uh, perhaps I think the the digital, you know, the Hathaway cable, the cable companies have already given uh, a decent return in this last year because there was a build-up right. to the October event. But, you know, there's a lot more waiting to unfold. All right, so Sharmila appears to be bullish on media stocks. Nilesh, I hope that answers your query. Let's take a very quick break. We'll come back in just a bit. Do keep watching Informed Investor. Welcome back. You're watching Informed Investor and answering all of your queries this week are Sharmila Joshi and Hemant Rustagi. Now it's time for us to get in a lot more questions from our viewers. So here's a question, Hemant, that's going to be right up your alley. We have a caller from Delhi who wants to know about education loans. Go ahead, Vivek. What's your question? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Vivek. I'm a sales executive at a leading FMCG company and get transferred every few years. 
Recently, I have relocated from Kolkata to Delhi. My daughter wants to apply for an education loan, but since she does not have an address proof yet, oh. uh, will a letter from my company suffice? Otherwise, what are my options as regards furnishing a guarantee? All right, uh, Hemant, you want to take this question because I know there are recent some RBI guidelines also to this effect. Yeah, you know. First thing is, it, you know, an important factor is how much loan he wants to take. Right. Uh, generally, the banks give loan up to 10 lakhs for educa higher education in India. And if it is abroad, then it's around uh, 20 lakhs. First thing is he needs to really decide how much uh, loan he needs to take. The requirement for loan are uh, different. For mm. example, if the loan amount is up to 4 lakhs, uh, there is no guarantor required, there is no collateral required. Right. And if, if the loan amount is from 5 to 7.5 lakh, in that case, uh, you know, the third party guarantor is required. And if the loan amount is beyond 7.5 lakh, mm. in that, ca that case, generally the bank would insist that you know, there has to be a tangible collateral. In this case, what, what I'm assuming that he doesn't have his own, own property, own property maybe. Yeah. Uh, so basically, then when I'm talking about tangible uh, you know, assets, he can also have uh, fixed deposit, for example. If he has mm. fixed deposit, bonds, national savings certificates, that he can offer as, as a collateral. Uh, and, and I think, uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, RBI is actually, uh, the government finance ministry is setting up uh, a credit guarantee fund. And, and the reason for that is that many students are finding it difficult to get loan. Right. And the whole idea is in this case, 75% of the loan will be guaranteed by the government and 25% by the bank. Right. I think this will make the whole process very simpler. In his case, like I mentioned, it will all depend on the kind of loan he wants to take. He should go back to the bank and find out. I don't think there should be uh, much of a difficulty there. All right, Vivek. So I hope that answers your question. But it's the Diwali special episode. And how can we not have a query on gold? So we have uh, Nishit Garodia who calls in from Ahmedabad and wants to know about gold ETFs and tax implications. Go ahead, Nishit. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, my name is uh, Nishit Guradia. My question is, uh, if I invest uh, 5,000 each month through a SIP, uh, Reliance Gold ETF, uh, will I have the flexibility to invest variable amounts as mm -hmm. an increase uh, more, in, more in the future or reduce a little bit? And uh, will that amount uh, which I invest uh, come under uh, Section 8TC? Also, uh, which is the best gold ETF in India currently? All right. Uh, Shamila, you want to take that? It's a slightly uh, complicated question, but I think that uh, if you have fixed an amount for an SIP, then I don't think that you can really vary it uh, uh, per month. And I think the best ETF is like uh, it's a little difficult to tell because I think they also uh, are talking of goals of different uh, stand, uh, you know, different varieties. Right. And so I think that's the other thing that you uh, need to uh, study before uh, uh, you pick your uh, ETF. So I think they're all good. Uh, I don't think that there is any you can single out and say that is uh, bad. But a gold ETF or a gold fund? A gold ETF. No. Oh, would you advise uh, investment in an ETF perhaps vis-a-vis -a, -vis a fund? See, he is already, I think, doing an SIP. So I think that's the best approach to take in any case because of the way uh, prices have been. So I think he should continue with that. Right. And uh, uh, not really worry too much about which is the best in that sense. All right, Nishit, I hope uh, you know, that satisfies your query. But for anyone who has ever worked in the corporate world and has changed jobs, they know the effort that it takes to either withdraw or transfer their EPF. So our next caller has a question along those lines. We have with us Harsh, who calls in from Mumbai. Hi, Harsh, what's your question? Hello, ma'am, this is Harsh here. I've worked in an IT company for four years, and currently I'm looking to change my job. So, can you tell me whether I should draw my EPF or I should uh, I should transfer it to an EPF account? All right. Uh, Hemant, what's the suggestion for him? Well, Harsh, I think uh, there are three factors that I actually need to look at. You know, one, he's saying that he has completed the only four years there. Hmm. Now, if you withdraw your provident fund within five years, the entire amount is then taxable. So, I don't hmm. think it really makes sense to actually do that. Second is legally. It is mandatory to transfer the EPF if you are joining another employer who is giving this facility of EPF to his employees. Now what happens is many people I know that they actually withdraw the money. And the reason for that is that when you are working for an employer, you get a, you know EPF account number. And uh, if you are unemployed for a period of two months, then you can actually draw this money. So many, many uh, employees are actually you know, using that as and then for getting out of EPF. But as far as you are concerned, my advice to you would be that you should transfer your EPF to the new employer 
because EPF, according to me, plays a very significant part in the retirement planning. Not everyone actually plans for retirement the way it should be done ideally. Right. So I think EPF plays a very important role. And it's only if he continues that he will get the benefit of power of compounding. Uh, because uh, even though the returns could be you know, somewhere in the range of 8.5 to 9, 9.5, but the fact that it's a tax-free return, it can actually build a sizable uh, you know, corpus over a period of time. So my advice definitely is that you must transfer it. I don't think it's advisable to even think of uh, withdrawing that. It's not really go going to be good for your financial future. All right, and as informed investor, we absolutely love the power of compounding, so I hope that answers your question, Harsh. But we have another caller with us. Steffi joins in from Goa. She holds 500 shares of PNB. <laughs> And it appears she's making a bit of a loss on that. Uh, Shamila, uh, you know, what's the call on that? But before that, in fact, let's hear out what Steffi actually wants to know. Steffi, go ahead. Hi, this is Steffi. I'm calling from Goa. I purchased 500 shares of PMB, which I purchased at rupees 1,100 in August 2010. The stock has fallen considerably since then. Should I continue holding on to it? What's the call, Sharmila? <laughs> I think, again, a tough call, largely because we've seen uh, NPA concerns for PNB uh, mount up in the interim uh, two years. So it's been a tough two years, I would say, for a lot of PSU banks, you know, given the fact that interest rates are where they are and uh, there has really been no respite. I mean, a lot of the sectors, key core sectors, which a lot of these PSUs were invested in are the ones, uh, you know, which are facing problem. But I, as I said, you know, I think that the next, the next year should see a lot of these, uh, you know, problems sort out. So uh, I would say hold, uh, and uh, if you have, you know, shares the ability to stay invested for another year, I think give it a shot and uh, see how. Uh, because for me, this is not the price to sell the right. stock. You know, that's uh, that's the uh, that's the real reason why I'm saying hold. So I don't think that this is a good price to sell PNB. Uh, wait for you know the interest rates to come in and wait for a couple of quarters, see how they really clean up their act, and then take a call. All right, so you've been brave, Steffi, for two years, and perhaps another year won't do you much harm if it's possible for you to hold on, but I hope that answers your question. Let's take a very quick break. This Diwali special of Informed Investor continues on the other side. Stay with us. Hi, welcome back. You're watching Informed Investor and with us, uh, you know, to advise our clients, uh, we have with us Sharmila Joshi and Hemant Rustagi and here's wishing all of you, of course, a very happy new year. So we have time for one more query on the show and here's an SMS that comes in from Sujata Murthy. She wants to know about circuit filters and uh, specifically the basis on which circuit filters are fixed for certain scripts and how investors can find this information. Uh, the information is available on uh, both the NS is available on the NSC uh, website, and uh, I think the rules are fairly simple. Uh, broadly, you follow the uh, and outline that you know the uh, stocks in FNO have a certain limit, and uh, the rest of the stocks have a certain limit. It's only when you n notice that there is uh, untoward activity or there is uh, too much volatility in a stock, then the circuit filters are bought lower and they are made 5%. But I think otherwise, uh, on an average, they are 10% uh, and uh, for FNO stocks, they are more. Uh, and uh, I think there is a, uh, there is, uh, you know, the, the, you can relax the limit. Uh, if it hits the circuit, then I think you have to take that breather and uh, they can be allowed to uh, be uh, extended for the day. But uh, largely, it's if the stock is too volatile or if, uh, you know, it has shown that pattern that, you know, it's, uh, that there could be some suspicious trading, then they put it in that uh, trade for trade or they reduce the circuit limit to 5%. All right, so Jatha, so I hope uh, that's an uh, answer you're satisfied with. But uh, Heyman, just as a last comment, we're uh, a little out of time. Uh, you know, we're approaching that time of the year again. So any tax-saving ideas you want to leave our viewers with? Well, as you rightly mentioned, you know, the right way to actually, you know, save for uh, taxes is to invest throughout the year, but not many investors do that. So typically, they end up, you know, making haphazard decision in the last three or four months of the financial year. So first advice is that don't take make any decision in a hurry. Uh, think about how much tax you need to pay and look at which some compulsory investment that you need to make, like you have a PPF, commitment, uh, life insurance, uh, you know, premium and housing loan. Look at those and then look at other options. There are right. two investment options I would like them to look at this year. One is Rajiv Gandhi equity scheme, hmm. which is basically meant for the first time investors in equities. Right. If you have income up to 10 lakh, you can invest in 
uh, top 100 stocks at any exchange. Uh, there, or you can also invest in mutual fund scheme or ETF. I think you will see mutual fund launching these kind of funds. So I think someone who's looking at uh, taking exposure to equity should look at this. Second is under Section 80D, you have this health insurance premium up to 15,000. Uh, in this year budget, there was a provision made that you know you can go for a preventive health checkup and spend up to 5,000 rupees. So if you have okay. not exhausted your limit of 15,000 on uh, life insurance premium, uh, health insurance premium, uh, one should definitely look at it and to take care of both the physical health as well as financial health. Well, absolutely. And Shamila, just as we're about to wrap up, any stock tips or investment ideas you want to leave us with for 2013? Uh, sure. You know, since we spoke of banks, I think within the private banking space, you can look at uh, ICICI Bank and Indusind Bank. Uh, I think within uh, the capital goods space, I continue to like uh, BHEL and uh, uh, I think the interesting mid-cap stocks that I would recommend would be Tata Global Beverages and Godrej Industries. <laughs> well, we like those, don't we? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Armila, for joining yeah. us. Thanks so much, Hemant. It was a pleasure having you both over. And, of course, a very, very happy New Year. I hope it's all that and more. And here's also where we need to wrap up. But whether it's Diwali or not, at Informed Investor, we hope that your investments continue to work and reward you. That's about all the time we have on this episode. But do keep uh, writing in to us and sending us your questions as well as your comments. And as always, we'll see you here next weekend. Bye-bye.